What would you do if you were having a conversation and uh, and you were tripping up over your words a little bit? You'd be like, ah, blah, and you'd panic and leave. (laughs) Brunch, hit it, boys. Huge news. He's back. The guy, Hamburglar, back. We've been waiting. We've been waiting for, uh, there's been a disappearance of Ronald McDonald and Hamburglar from our lives for probably like the last decade and a half, two decades. Mm. And we fleshed out the, the Hamburglar debacle. Where Devotees he, will remember. That he we, is a ham robber. He is more of a ham robber because famously, uh, burglary does not involve contact, whereas Robert de- robbing does. So if you've not heard us talk about this in the past, if you come home and your shit's gone, you have not been robbed. You've been burgled and... Burglarized. Uh, yes, you've been burglarized. Bur- burgled, both. Or, burgled is a word? Uh, oh, yeah. Burgled. But burgled. I think burgled might... I think burglarized is correct, and burgled means like the act of taking it. Let's see. Burgled means... Uh, Enter a building illegally with intent to commit a crime, especially theft. Wait, so you can just wait. So you can just walk into a building with the intent, and you've already burgled. I think the burgling is the like high tiptoeing. That's that's <laughs> yeah, the, what it is. The, 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 yes. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the. I used a, a GIF and uh, matching music. We we are now pay for patreon.com slash listen to brunch. Uh, we're, we're, we're killing ourselves here. <laughs> we pay for uh, a service that just gives us all the royalty-free music in the world. When when there's a big reckoning for, hey, you're not supposed to take that stuff and use that content, we're, we're trying to be on the right side of it. So we're paying for this royalty-free music service, which does save us a lot of time because if we need anything for any sort of mood, like I needed a do something sneakily, and it had like a lot of like... Uh, <laughs> Very, very nice sneaky music. But I think that it's once once you're getting the knees up a certain uh a certain level, there that's when maybe you're burglarizing. Yeah. And then it's when you actually take something that you've that you're being a thief. Instead of uh instead of high knees, we're now calling it the burglar threshold. Beanies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh anyway, Beanies. uh it's more if you're being robbed, that's when someone's making contact with you. They come up to you and they and famously, they take it in front of you or yeah. And what, famously, the hamburglar is a very social uh, burger thief. Not in his return, though. Have you seen this commercial? No. So McDonald's is rolling out these new hamburgers. Terrible move on their part because you don't don't attach the hamburger to that no one's gonna other than us because i'm explaining it to you no one's gonna talk about the you're doing new hamburgers the, the, the hamburger yeah. back the the headline is gonna end up being hamburgers back but they're showing these new hamburgers and you're seeing it through binoculars and then you see that from a distance the hamburger has his eyes on those things but okay. at the end of the commercial they have all the burgle the the uh, burgers <laughs> burgles on a tray and the hand reaches in and pulls it away. With there being a cameraman there and seemingly employees at the restaurant, he's not being a hamburglar. He's being a ham robber. Yeah, fair. Uh, okay, that so that you this is feels like you're right. They kind of buried the lead in that like they're changing the burgers. Yeah, I didn't know that that was happening. I just you, knew you, that the hamburger they attached. The uh, it, it would honestly be like, hey, I got new podcast shoes. Uh, and like also Idris Elba's helping me tie them, <laughs> yeah. and then you're like. What are you doing hanging out with Idris Elba? And I'm like, I just I got shoes. <laughs> We're talking about those. Yeah, uh, apparently McDonald's is improving its hamburger, cheeseburger, double cheeseburger, McDouble burger, and Big Mac. All of them. Uh, improvements include softer sandwich buns, which are now toasted golden browned, perfectly melted cheese, and juicier caramelized flavor from adding white onions to the patties while still on the grill. Okay, so that's the part that I'm like, well, what the fuck were you doing before? How else are you putting the, the onions on the patties? Are you grilling the onions, then putting them somewhere else on like an onion plate, then putting the burgers on a burger? Like, this is what you've been doing? This has to be what you've been doing all along. I've seen the founder. I know, but I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like every part of the, the McDonald's burger is like prepared separately because it's so, it's so like, uh, 
it's such like a factory thing where it's mm. like this part comes from this part. Assembly this part, line. Yeah, 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 right. So I don't know. Like the fact that they think that they can improve the McDonald's burger is encouraging because let me tell you what's already basically perfect. Awesome. The McDonald's burger. You know what they should do to improve McDonald's? Have uh, a nice little uh, hot to trot Linda Cardellini come in with some like powderized milkshake bullshit. And then uh, leave her husband for you. Hell yeah, that's right, baby. <laughs> Talking about the founder. I've seen that you movie a hundred that times. Movie. That's a great movie. It is a great. movie. If you haven't seen the founder, get on that shit. It's amazing. It, that definitely falls into my Linda uh, Cardellini's character. Totally good to go. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my favorite part of that about that movie is that it falls into my favorite uh, genre of movie, the one that you have grown to hate, which is does this really need a story? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I just I hate the question, and I hate like the and I I did a who is this for thing last week. There there's like maybe four questions that can be asked about every movie. Yeah. That sometimes you really do more get the urge where like like with Mario, we're like kind of feel like I'm wondering who is this for, and you're like <laughs> fuck, I don't want to do the who is this for thing. But the uh, the, the uh, this the founder is an important movie for me because it is the first time I had ever heard the term. Uh, incel i'm not gonna blow oh. up this person's spot but a friend of the podcast didn't like the the founder and was like it if was i ryan w- lambert wasn't yeah it? <laughs> i knew it yeah Just and he was like if friend I w- of the podcast didn't like something yeah ryan lambert 90 percent of the time and he said uh he was like i don't want to see uh like two incels get bullied by michael keaton or something and he's basically saying like they made those two the, the mcdonald brothers like so dopey and yeah. so easy to be taken advantage of and i can't remember if i asked him like what's incel mean and i looked it up and i was like involuntarily celibate okay cool so i got an idea of what that meant and then maybe a year later people started really saying incel to mean like angrier like horrible people and yeah. i was like yeah i guess that can also mean that but i truly took the first time i heard incel i took it as like some guys struggling that, that's right that are just like yeah i suppose i'd like to have a lady and fall in love but hasn't happened yet yeah and i'm like oh <laughs> and now they're getting pushed around by michael keaton i hear your point rl Keaton's yeah. being too mean i mean you're right the the uh Come the, on, the term the term incel incel has basically be, been hijacked and now it like exclusively means like white guys who are angry and like want to kill everybody yeah there's some, this is going to, I was going to say, like, there's some nice incels out there, but that just sounds like it's, it could be taken out of context to be like, <laughs> standing up for the bad, horrible, mean people. But the first time I heard that term, I truly did think, like, just nice, well-meaning, sad guys. Yeah. Uh, so that's the Hamburglar update. <laughs> it's uh, huge. We've uh, we've got a loaded episode today. We've got Matt Mayer, uh, the great Matthew Mayer from AIR. We'd said uh, before we knew we were having him on the podcast that... He was very, very close to stealing the show in air if it weren't for Viola Davis being Viola Davis and not letting anybody else be the best part of a movie because she's Viola Davis. Uh, We had an awesome conversation with him. He's a Boston guy, grew up with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. He was in this Dunks commercial with Ben Affleck. He's been in a ton of stuff with not just those guys. He's done everything. When I've told people that we had him on, every person has had a different like oh from whatever and i'm like yeah he was in that he's in so many things he's worked with sean baker martin scorsese he's done just everything the guy's uh, a he's legend. quite a memorable guy he, he's just i i knew I, I think i said at the top of the podcast i was like this is going to be a brunchy guy so yeah. even though i'd never spoken to him before but just he's always had those vibes and i'd recently seen a movie that he did called funny pages in which he plays somebody horrifying it's an a24 movie and it's an extremely a24 movie and before we started recording with him i was just like yo please don't bring any of those vibes into this conversation because scared the shit out of me man he rules though and we had a really good conversation with him and i think that he truly uh we fucked around quite a bit and we hit a bunch of different things but uh I can't remember if he said it during the interview or off it, but he was uh, pretty excited to be 
just like talking to some Boston boys. And we uh, we talked about our high schools and everything. So look forward to that episode, or I'm sorry, that conversation later in the episode. Jump on the Patreon, patreon.com slash listen to brunch. We got a bunch of fun stuff up there. And now we're going to probably jack circling backs thing because this is a pretty packed episode and we've got to get some like recapping the weekend fun and looking forward to a week in fun because we got Father John Misty this weekend. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And I have a I have a great story about what just happened to me because before we went to record this podcast, yeah. I went to go pick up some uh some of the devil's flower for ah, Father John Misty this week and nice. uh that's for sure going to be quite a time, but I uh, I picked up some edibles while I was at the dispensary and I didn't realize that the edibles that I had purchased were like sex edibles. And I did not realize that that was a thing. Wow. But I, it, there was like nothing to indicate that they were like totally different. And maybe they're not totally different, but literally on the packaging on the back, it's like, yo, get out there and fuck my good buddy. What does it say? <laughs> it's, all right. So here's what it says on the back. It says, so I guess it's like the company or whatever is... Betty's Smash and Passion edibles, which in yeah. in hindsight, Smash and Reading Passion. Not our, uh, strong suit. But go on. <laughs> I mean, Smash and Passion could be anything. Yeah, that that does sound like something yeah. that they would do Just, for pot. Right. Yeah. Uh, it says on the back. It says, "Take Betty's into the bedroom with Smash and Passion, infused with a blend of natural aphrodisiacs and full spectrum cannabis. These passion fruit juice are sweet." are a sweet and romantic treat for you and yours. Choose passion, get pleasure. Uh, all right. And so, then there's like a, there's a, a, like, it's a, this has got horny goat weed in it. Really? Yeah. Okay. So is there like a warning on it? It's like, yo, like don't take this if you're not about to smash. <laughs> no. We're going to be acting weird as I don't shit. think so. Like, I don't think that if we take this before Father John Misty that we're just going to be standing in the crowd with full on erections. And that's at my least guess. Not, at least not from the gummies. If we have erections, it'll be because we're watching Father John Misty. No, if I'm on sex edibles and he starts playing <laughs> when you're smiling and astride me, I've said many a time on this podcast, probably the only time I've said the word sexy on this podcast, I think that is one of the most sexy that that is one of the sexiest songs in the world if i'm on a sex edible and that starts hitting <laughs> with those like very well paced will put it those like oh oh o's <laughs> and i got a sex edibles coursing through me lord forgive me <laughs> oh boy uh, no <laughs> lord forgive me i'm uh i'm gonna need to go to the merch stand for a little, <laughs> little bit <laughs> Oh, what am I saying? Um, no, I, 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 my guess on that would be because there is the like the hey, like want to smoke, and it's not phrased this way, but like want to smoke a little weed and goof around, sort of thing. Like weed can be, uh, are you four of years course, old? A, a right, it, but it can be like a companion to yeah. whatever you may be doing with your significant other. So I think it's very possible. They just slapped on, yeah, like, yeah, probably. for sex yeah. onto this, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's, a lot of things are better when you're high, right? And sex would be one of those things. Like if they, if they made like music edibles, yeah, yeah, I probably would have not a bad branding the choice. place out during the yeah. pandemic, but yeah. Also, like I feel like that's sad like, bagels. <laughs> like whoa, yeah. I do feel like that's like definitely becoming a thing with uh, with weed in particular, where like the market is now like it's booming yeah. and it's very oversaturated, and a lot of people that are getting into the game are doing like very niche things to separate themselves or to like appeal to uh, like a specific audience. So like doing the sex thing would be like for somebody who's who's like not like an experienced pot person and they walk into like a dispensary and they're like, Ooh, these ones are for sex. Yeah. I could get into this. Uh, somebody, so I've never, I have famously never uh, taken Molly before. And, mm. uh, one of my friends was saying it's a good time. And I was like, yeah, I did it once. And I just like, didn't, didn't do, didn't much, do anything. Much of an effect. Yeah. It, she, it was probably like pop rocks. I was in like high school. I think mm. she was like, you uh she was like oh it's great like there's so it, it just enhances a bunch of stuff like you should have sex on molly and i just like immediately got anxiety i was like so wait the first thing i'm supposed to do when <laughs> on taking a, a drug dr on a new drug <laughs> is have sex 
Absolutely not. I'm going to need a three-week trial yes. money-back guarantee in my living room on the couch before I get anywhere near another person on a new drug. It's like somebody, it's like being like, oh, I've never seen that article of clothing before. It's like, you should run a marathon wearing it. <laughs> yeah. it's like, oh, boy. I uh, I think I, I'd, I'd want to pick out an outfit first. No, no, no. You should wear these stiff pants and run a marathon. Yeah, man. Um, but I, I did come up with a great idea during this. Once you said oversaturation, I thought of a bajillion dollar idea. And maybe I'll pitch it to some of my friends that work in both of these spaces. Gambling weed. <laughs> Because I, I don't if there's know. two places that are throwing their money <laughs> yeah. at everything, it's gambling companies and like pot places. So if you just make gambling weed, like I, what I'll do, I, I'll start pitching myself as like the stoner gambler. I will be the richest man in the world, and they'll make they can make a strain of gambling weed, and all it is is just like weed. <laughs> Yeah, but like, what's like, what's the hook? What's the hook on any of that shit? Well, I mean, like, having sex weed, you're like, okay, uh, the, the sex is going to be better. You ever win a high. bet? That's that's true, but that's a high in itself. The you vibes, man. You don't need to enhance that. Well, I guess you could say the same thing about sex. You ever win a bet with like a room full of your boys? Sure, sure have. Sex? Have you? You're on a fucking. I am ice on a cold, cold streak. streak. I am on a cold, and this is truly the. I've more seen friends go on bad cold streaks, and I don't. I try not to hold it against them, but I just kind of make the mental note of like I don't think they're on a cold streak. I think they suck at betting because it never, never happens to me. Yeah. And the last couple of weeks, I've been really, really chasing it, and I'm like, hmm, time like to I pay suck the at piper. Gambling. Yeah. yeah. I uh, my big my big uh, problem. Uh, over the past couple of weeks has been winning, but then following up the high of winning by like being like, okay, we're on a roll, and then losing on live bets. Yeah, live bets are no good. Uh, I famously jumped on the oil men yeah, last yeah. night. And, and and what an idiot I am. You had told me five minutes earlier that you were on the coldest of cold streaks of all time, and then you were like, but I'm on Oilers for overtime, and I was like, cool, same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no shit, man. Me too. <laughs> I've totally been on it. Jump on. That was such a good idea. Yeah, man. But even that, so, like, we just, we have so much shit, we're, and we'll still fuck around on this podcast, uh, to, that we can't spend 100 years on being happy that the NHL playoffs are here. But even watching the Oilers chunk it in magnificently Oilers fashion last night, game one, I was like, yeah, like we've I, arrived, baby. We're yeah, here. I mean, like, I don't, I, I, I like the Oilers and I want them to make a deep run, but I don't want them to make like a perfect deep run. Yeah. I want them to be chaotic and bad at times. I, it, it, it would feel a few weird. Days where like, no questions about Skinner happens, yeah. and like, forget it. I'm out right. on the Oilers. Yeah, we would. You want you want the chaos. You want the ups and downs, uh, the roller coaster ride of the Oilers, especially because the Bruins aren't going to lose a game for like the first three rounds. I told you yesterday, though. I don't feel very good because I am increasingly seeing this. I bet uh, a few weeks ago, I bet Oilers and Bruins to meet in the Stanley Cup final, mm -hmm. and I placed futures on both the Bruins and Oilers to win the cup. And when I told you that yesterday, you were like, yeah, I'm hearing like a lot of people like, everybody are that confident I've seen, in the Oilers. Everybody I've seen has picked the Oilers to come out of the Western Conference. And like th that, it does make a lot of sense because the West is wide open and nobody's great. And the Oilers were great in the second half. They were yeah. like the best team in the league. But like the, I would expect to see more of the Avs in a lot of people's picks because they're as healthy as they've been all year. And like it's, they're they're more reliable than the fucking Oilers, but I, I've literally like basically only seen the Oilers and Bruins. And after I uh, said after we had that conversation, uh, television writer extraordinaire and great podcaster and guy of whom I'm ju I've just become a massive fan, Dave Damashek, uh tweeted essentially the same thing. Like late uh, yesterday afternoon, he's like really thought and he's a huge hockey guy who's like really been like going back and forth on a lot of things but i've officially locked in bruins versus oilers in the cup final and just from following him and knowing he's a big hockey guy and everything that may again made me feel bad because i was like fuck every everybody thinks this and like and the it's smart never, it's people never think the this. every the everybody right. thing yeah so that's not that, what happens and initially like i was leaning bruins oilers and then i started seeing everybody do that and because of like hey it's never what everybody expects and i'm not gonna pick against the bruins i changed my western conference pick and we we did we did come up with like a rule uh that 
we can only put futures or uh, Stanley Cup futures on one team in each conference. Yeah. And I, be- I believe we both have the Bruins. Yes. Because we're smart. Oh, boy. Uh, you picked the Oilers because you're an oil man. Yeah. So I ended up going in a different direction. And I laid my Western Conference future bet yesterday on the Dallas Stars, who promptly lost yeah. one of their like few good forwards. They're like largely a one-line team, and a big part of that one line is Joe Pavelski. And don't know when the next time we'll see him is. So not feeling great about the Dallas Stars future right now, but playing hockey left to be played. Yeah, and like they kind of looked kitty at points in that game kitty yeah like childish yeah yeah but i mean like they were the better team so like there's you there's very well-rounded double-edged sword here top five in everything but goals yeah i mean and then they have one of the best goaltenders in the league like and when you do look at like everything that you probably want to start with for like a true contender you need like a dominant top line with like a superstar they got that uh, you need a solid defense. They got that. You need elite goaltending. They have that. They, you need special teams. They have that on both sides. So they do have like all of the check marks that you would look for, which is why I'm why, why I ended up going with them. Uh, but they can't really afford to lose much, and they've already lost something, and they already lost a game in which they were the better team, which is a bad sign. It's not good when. Uh, like an hour into the playoffs, you and I were texting each other about how Joe Pavelski is Joey Maldini from yeah, no. uh, from Your Honor, and that uh, like obviously he did not look good, but he goes from like one of the people in the thing to like fi- like is he's going to be like alive? popping in yeah. and out. Like, yeah. are we going to see him for? a uh, little bit like when they went to leah hextall after he left the ice she was definitely choosing her words carefully to not be like fuck i just saw some stuff i didn't like yeah i mean like he she was just like he looked distressed and i was like fuck he yeah. looked distressed god damn it if anybody missed it joe bavelski got, took, a, took a big yeah. hit bounces that off the ice and was like clearly very concussed yeah. and had a hard time getting off the ice and this is not the first time that that has been the case for him, which is never a good thing to see. So uh, prayers up to Joe Pavelski. I like that guy a lot. And also the stars kind of need him. Yeah. For more of this stuff, jump on uh, the uh, Bally sh- socials and check that out because we're going to be chatting a little bit about all the the teams. I am kind of bummed that the way it lines up, I'm doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Frank Valley is doing um, a Tuesday and Thursday. And this week, the way it lines up is Frank gets to do the Bruins and Lead Dogs. And mm-hmm. I was hoping that we could... Get, we'll probably look ahead to Lead Dog stuff. And I think that the Bruins and, uh, and LDs will be coursing throughout the conversation anyway. But... I did wonder this. This is the last hockey point I'll make before we talk about all the sports we've been doing. But I wonder if at the end of the of game one, players are sitting in the dressing room, a little despondent. They're like, fuck, we, we took our best shot at the Bruins, and it just uh, it didn't take. We came out. We were really physical, even intentionally dirty, just to know we're not going to take any shit. Fuck, it just didn't take. Paul Maurice comes in, and he's like... Look, guys, uh, you've been busy the last like uh, couple of hours, so you probably haven't been on social media and everything, but uh, they're killing you for the lead dogs thing. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got to put that away. Yeah, like, you, <laughs> no yeah. more of that shit. <laughs> Twitter's not going to be good when you log in. So uh, well, before you head out to any of your press conferences, just know you're uh, probably going to get some questions. They're uh, they're roasting you in the quote retweets. <laughs> Beating that ass, <laughs> that would be amazing. The uh, the 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 lead dogs or the uh, team that plays in Sunrise, Florida, were wearing shirts that say "Lead Dogs," and when famously, their their actual team name is very closely associated with a cat because it is a cat. It's They're literally called a the cat. Florida Panthers, and I don't member know, of the cat family for sure. I don't know what it was, but man friend of the podcast emily kaplan doing them extremely dirty by putting that out there there are some things like if 
Uh, There's no way that Emily Kaplan had any idea that that was going to get torched as much as it did after right, she put that out. Right. Like, if you do a bad tweet, I'm not going to retweet you for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way I'm not touching that, yeah. though. It's the most embarrassing thing. I'm like, let's thing. keep that. Let's keep that down. The fewer people that see it, the better it is for everybody. <laughs> uh, but dogged reporter that that uh, Emily is, she I think she accidentally... <laughs> <laughs> Shared the most embarrassing, but it, it, I, not Emily's fault. They were no, wearing, definitely. They not. put it on shirts. Yeah, right. They yeah. put it on shirts. They literally wore it on their sleeve. Would be very, very funny though if the lead dogs like don't talk to Emily Kaplan anymore. And they're <laughs> like, like, "What the fuck, fuck? you? <laughs> nice one. Thanks for that." I actually have had players in the past be like, get a little mad at me for being like, "Why did you?" Why'd you put the thing out there that I said on the record that was stupid of me to say? What the fuck, man? What the hell's what, what, what was all that completely in context shit doing me dirty like that? They definitely uh, they definitely need to uh, scrap that and go back to the drawing board and consider a rebrand before game two. Bad and, news. Uh, the, 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 the dog's already out of the crate. It is. It's it's out there, man. Uh, if you've ha- if you got a brand that you also want to uh, to tweak, maybe rebrand, maybe blast out there, you're gonna need a website because everything these days runs through the internet, and Squarespace is the place that you want to be because they allow you to build your brand, grow out your business online with a beautiful website that also helps you engage your audience and sell anything, products, content, even your time. Uh, Squarespace is a multifaceted tool to help build out a digital platform and they've got plenty of product features that help you do it including appointment scheduling so if you need something to to build out a planner or schedule appointments and clients they got you there there's a great video studio that's included on Squarespace. So if you're a content creator, you can churn out pro-level videos pretty effortlessly. Uh, they've got like a studio app that allows you to make engaging videos and help reach and grow your audience and drive sales. They've also got an uh, opportunity that allows you to do email campaigns to get into people's uh, mailboxes and collect subscribers and convert them into loyal customers. And obviously there's the, 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 the stuff that's very important these days, which is, you know, social media integration and analytics that allow you to see what's working, what's not, what you can improve upon, what you should key in on to really captivate your audiences. So if you want to create a beautiful Squarespace website, that helps put some money in your pocket and grow whatever business that you're running or whatever uh, content creation, whatever, you know, if you're, if you're just trying to, to, to key in on an audience, Squarespace got you covered, go to squarespace.com slash brunch for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, use the offer code brunch to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain that's squarespace.com slash brunch for a free trial and then 10% off your first purchase. I, I won't lie. That whole read, I was definitely thinking thinking about Squarespace. I couldn't take my eyes off myself. This is like a way better kit. I already like this kit, but this I'm, I'm rocking this new uh, Revs Earth Day mm-hmm. kit. This thing, even like the piping and everything, this is a very nice kit. I like it. It's it's uh it's busy, but it's like busy in a great soccer kit way. So the only tweak I said I would have made, uh, and yeah, you're this pointing makes me at it right now, and I don't like it. Most of my issues with jerseys, for some reason, are always collar related. Mm-hmm. Like, like wrong collar. Yeah, use a different well, collar. I mean, we're really getting away from jer- jerseys just using a crew, crew neck yeah. collar, and like it always just looks better. And maybe. Maybe just specifically from like a casual fan wearing perspective, yeah. Because like, I'm sure like a crew neck collar is probably not as great on like a performance piece of yeah. whatever, like a jersey. But like, we wear it as like casual like it's fashion statements. Yeah. So like, I I want more crew neck collars, especially on like when it's like a V neck type. I it just doesn't work for my body. Yeah. This thing does look sick, though. It's and awesome. I love it. Shout out the Revs for giving it to me. We didn't really get to get the fits off that we wanted to. Uh, this this week famously uh, included Marathon Monday. Mm-hmm. And 
Patriots Day in Massachusetts, and I believe Wisconsin, maybe? There's one other state that celebrates Patriots Day. Interesting. Uh, I think it's Wisconsin. A uh, friend of the podcast, Wisconsin. Uh, Matt McCarthy, w- was saying that on the radio. Uh so everybody goes to the Red Sox game and they have an 11 10 start and it's a great time and you make a whole day of it. And with the Bruins playing and the lead dogs, it was even better. Uh, but I, I, I had a, just kind of a weird day. A, I'm not really uh, drinking these days. So I have this weird, I was just out hangover that I haven't really experienced before. Like my voice is so tired just from like being in a loud place for the first time in forever. Someone tweeted, damn, at DJ Bean, short as hell. That was a wild, that's a wild tweet to just get randomly. And that like, re- not that for me, but rattled for you. me a little bit. The game was rained out and never, or not rained out, but it did a lot of stops and starts, getting cooked in the bets and everything. Um, but yeah, the, the short as hell thing is weird. I replied to the person. Because I was like, maybe they confused me with Pete or something. Mm -hmm. I said, you saw someone else. I'm fine. And they replied with the Tim Robinson, uh, like, you sure about that? I was like, fuck. Am I short? No, I don't think you're short. And I wouldn't care if I was short, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. I don't think you're short, but that's also coming from me, not a reliable source. Yeah, you famously. Although, like, I would know what is short because I, I'm famously am very okay being short and acknowledging the fact that I'm short. Yeah, would not say that you're short. Would also not say that you're tall. I exactly. Like, I that's the thing. But I'm, you're just average. I am inoffensive. Yeah, right. Uh, famously, uh, what size shoe do you wear? Fuck you. <laughs> I'm, I'm rocking a, a larger foot than a, a lot of people. There was a. Uh, there was a DJ Bean chant in my section for like the one second that the Red gameplay Sox was getting happening. Hammered. Yeah, yeah, it was. It didn't. It didn't really grow. Who started it? Uh, it was the guy. A section over. Oh, that's I, I, wild. I was going to my seat. I was like DJ Bean. And I like waved at him, and he was like, "Yeah." And he's like DJ Bean, DJ, and then like two to three more people joined in, <laughs> and I was like, "If this number goes up, it'll be." Just a pretty incredible moment. Yeah. It didn't go up. It just stayed at like three to four for a little bit. And then I think it was so low that like everyone was able to quit at the same time. It didn't like die out or anything. But I was like, hey, not a not a bad little day. And then like a minute later, someone tweeted like, look at that short motherfucker. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the chanting thing does give me like a little bit of anxiety just because like anytime a chant starts, I'm always waiting for it to, to die down. And I have like a horrible secondhand embarrassment if somebody, if somebody uh, continues it and then figures out that, it, oh, well, this is done now. And they get caught in that middle point. Yeah, it's like when somebody's singing and then like the radio turns off and they have to like, like sh- stop short real quick. Yeah, you got to finish it. That's what I would do. I would just finish the phrase. Yeah, but like you, you, you it's like a. It's That's a, my live na- TV you, brain. Though. You can't really like naturally catch it though because you're like, oh shit! There's like a moment of panic and like so you adjust automatically. I think I'm conditioned though to just like kind of do uh maybe even like a little ryan reynolds like wink at the camera thing of like oh like it's my show now well like <laughs> oh that was weird or whatever and in- instead of like defaulting to like the uh, yeah oh, no i default sh- to that because i've had anxiety and i hate it <laughs> oops um i'd say in life that's like the key to making a- any mistakes not that i should be giving out advice on anything but like if you make a little thing just like do what you would do normally like yeah, if you I mean, trip up over so your words when you're say. speaking what would you do if you were having a conversation and uh, and you were tripping up over your words a little bit? You'd be like, ah, blah, and you'd right. panic and leave. <laughs> <laughs> you'd run away. Uh, Misty this weekend. Yeah, I'm very excited. We, we got, got the back to back, back to back concert weekends for your boys and like In absolute uh, pillars of our existence. Mm-hmm. Father John Misty and Houndmouth back to back weekends. Uh, Going to be a great time. Uh, very very excited. Uh, speaking of the the music thing we have oh, yeah. uh, we have a shared friend who referred to you as musical philip seymour hoffman Love last it. week thank you and the way in which that happened was fucking incredible because he called you musical philip seymour hoffman which was meant as a compliment and then was like i was like i don't care what that's meant as yeah. i will be saying possibly even tweeting like have been called <laughs> 
the Philip Seymour Hoffman of music. And then he was like, the only way this the, this story can possibly end now is that if you and Mr. Philip Seymour Hoffman meet meet each other, shake each other's hand, and acknowledge each other's existence, and you were like... So I screen grabbed and sent to you, and I was like, got bad news for <laughs> the our old, boy. Uh, the old The Batman meme. Does he know? <laughs> <laughs> He, in fact, did not know, which that's what a me, way to learn that yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman's dead and like been dead. Like, yeah. like not news. Like he is. I, I, I say this seriously. Like he is famously dead. Correct. Like it is very well known. It, and it made waves big news when he story. died. Yeah. Big, like devastating news story. Yes. And it's just like I cannot wrap my brain around how that happened because to throw out philip seymour hoffman as like like the like the, the one actor that would pop into your mind as being like the gold standard to compare you to means that you're a philip seymour hoffman like fan right you are in on that guy like he didn't go with brad pitt didn't go with like someone more relevant or say alive like mm. uh ryan gosling mm. any of those names leonardo dicaprio went straight to philip seymour hoffman but wasn't a fan enough to know that that guy died years ago. Yeah. When did he die? Like f- three, four years ago now? No. I, I He had to be like 2013. 2014. Really? No later than 2015, I'm going to say, Philip Seymour Hoffman died. Wh- 2014? Wow. Uh, yeah, I would have guessed like 2018, something like that. I mean, you also have to like... Anything that happened between 2018 and 2023. Yeah, it is all kind of. It seems like it was a year ago, but it was five years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Shit. Miss him. I mean, we could unpack what it means to be the musical Philip Seymour Hoffman. I think it's got to just mean that, like, you're um, eclectic. Yeah, talented. right. I, I think it, it. I think it did mean some sort of um, like artsy fartsy, maybe a some little like bit. weird. Because this was in reaction to Baseball Manager, which uh, is uh, streaming on Spotify. So if you want to add that to playlists and everything, right now I believe it has fewer than a thousand listens, which doesn't matter. Who, who cares? But on your Spotify profile, uh, when it says your top songs, mm-hmm. sometimes it'll throw a recent one in there. And if it doesn't have a thousand listens, it'll say it has fewer than a thousand listens, which that could mean nine hundred, that could mean one. And if only one person has streamed it, that's okay. But I don't know. Let's get let's give it a let's get out there. Let's and, give and, it a, a stream a baseball figure. manager. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's the story of how someone was like, "Hey, uh, you should die soon." <laughs> Speaking of someone dying soon, I liked this episode of Succession. As much as I liked any episode this season. And I loved the second episode. And of course, the third episode was great. But this man, I love a good Kendall episode. This was, this had spring. Maybe it was because this episode was funny again. And we just had a full episode that wasn't funny. But this was an awesome, awesome episode. So, yeah, I mean, like, I I think that three and four were like all time great succession episodes Mm -hmm. for completely different reasons and uh this four was maybe the best dialogue that we've ever seen in an episode of succession which is saying a whole lot and the way that four sets the table for the rest of the season is extraordinarily interesting yeah and i am a hundred percent in this was an incredible episode a amazing kendall episode a fantastic uh Tom episode and a fantastic Roman episode. Yeah. Carl and Jerry reacting to Tom saying, and may contain spoilers, I guess, saying that he would, I'll be very vague, throw his hat in the ring uh, was incredible. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not a spoiler to say that Tom is very clearly trying to play both sides. Yeah, and right. And clumsily going about it the entire way. But the, even though people occasionally will kind of put it in his face, it's just amazing when Tom gets hit with a, this is how people see you because this is what you are. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, and it's, it's funny because like at some point Tom is probably going to get burned and left, left for left for dead, uh, for lack of a better term. 
But like the one thing that you can say about that guy is he is a uh, a down ass bitch. If he is on your side, he will do whatever it takes to stay there, even if it is the dirtiest of dirty work. So like a ride or die, mm -hmm. but like not great about picking a side and sticking to it. I tweeted this after, but Kendall does some devious stuff and he does it while using some business speak and i remember one time i was having a, i was having some serious conversations with uh, a, a friend who was going through things and one time uh she called me and we were talking for a couple minutes and she was like yeah so um i don't really have any action items for this conversation but like just wanted to say whatever blah, blah. And it wouldn't have been appropriate to laugh, but it was just very funny that like action items was used in a, like, a social thing. Yeah. yeah. So Kendall saying action that as he is instructing someone to do something seedy as fuck. I was like, yeah, it, it made me think of the action items thing. But I was like, yeah, I got to work like action that and action items into my uh, my affairs. I mean like the Kendallisms are so fucking good throughout the course of the entire series yeah. where he's just like he is just an absolute buzzword sponge. Yeah. And it, it's it's so funny when it but like that one like didn't actually like catch me off guard but it is it like perfectly works for Kendall. That's how he would do that. Yeah. And I'm very excited to see where it goes in terms of like Kendall can never stay out of his own way so i like if if he was like suddenly good at running things mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't feel right or like fit but I'm, I'm curious to see if like he does have some sort of redemption or if he just com continues to fumble it and and fuck himself over and sabotage every, himself and everybody else around him we can speak about this in a non-spoiler way did you think that it was under or through um I, my answer is I don't fucking know when. Like that's why I, I yeah, love it. Yeah, I think that they. I they, love that the answer is they like, did it so perfectly that like there's no right answer. But, and before they showed it, I was like, that's, knowing this person, we will know. Like it, if it's through, it would be done with purpose. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Like this person would do and, it, but then you see it and you're like, ah, yeah. I don't know, Jim. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it, like the, I guess like I guess I would lean towards under. Mm -hmm. Because it starts under, and like when you're starting something, yeah. choosing the starting point is easier than the finish point. Correct. Uh, the, the big letters of a sign, the first few letters are that's They're, always intended. Yes, yeah. right. And then like the last letters are like, oh, this is what I have to work with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, that's why I would lean under, but you never know. And uh, like honestly, knowing the guy who did it, yeah, you can't rule out the true. the fact that that was just done purposefully. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, like uh, you guys figure it out. We can be, we can decide something gets bad or something stinks now or whatever, and stick through it and keep watching a bad show and be like, yeah, this isn't good anymore. But if there were ever proof that we are really, and you didn't get, you weren't as close to out on Barry as I was, mm -hmm. but if there were ever proof that like, hey, as long as the work is good and the product is good, we'll come back and we'll love it. Look at Barry right now. I am so fucking happy that Barry is A, back, and I'm just blown away by these first two episodes. And I was really, really thinking about quitting the show about halfway through last season because it had taken a lull and was just getting old. And whenever an Alec Berg show does that, you're like, well, yeah. But I know what this is then. This is just going to be because I remember, remember we, would, we were like, he has to, the, the shit, the, the, the it chickens has to, has get to come somewhere. home to roost. Yeah. Like, Silicon has, Valley spent way too much time just yeah, like, he must pay the price. Its life. He can't yeah. keep like almost getting caught for this thing that would have definitely sunk him by now. This, this show is so good right now, and both of the episodes that it premiered that premiered this past week were awesome. incredible. And that's even after when Succession ended, I wasn't even interested in watching Barry because Succession was so good that I was like, I 
don't want to watch anything but Succession again for the rest of my life. Yeah, they, and the, I mean, these episodes were great. It was, it was a, uh, they were great episodes in general, but they were also just like great pickup episodes where it's like, oh, this is what's great about Barry. Yeah, where it's like it had that darkness to it, and it had uh, like the moments of levity that you just like don't fucking expect. Yeah, to when like even when they are mixed with with dark humor, like. It's, it was a perfect reminder of how, like, ridiculous that show can be, but also, like, how real and dark it can be and mixing both of those things. It, it, both episodes were awesome. I think it set the, sets the table for a fantastic final season, which I'm glad is the final yes, season. Agree. Like, I'm glad that th th it seems like an increasing trend that showrunners and just shows in general are willing to call it themselves and be like, all right, this is it for us. We've got our direction. This is what we want to accomplish. We've done what we needed to do, and we're going to get out before it gets bad. And I love that, and I'm glad that Barry has done that because I, I don't think that Barry ever got to a point where it was really bad, but it was like, all right, like we we're kind of dancing around this thing for like a season and a half. Let's right. fucking let's get a move on and and start getting somewhere different. I give TJ Miller as much credit for that as I give Succession for Barry doing this. Truly, I like I, I think that like Alec Berg probably took a good look in the mirror or somebody said something to him after TJ Miller said all that shit. Do you remember that? No. TJ Miller when he left uh, Silicon Valley, no, which is essentially like. And it seemed like maybe he didn't have some great relationships there, but he it was also like, seemed like he was maybe not in like the best mental state. Of course, yeah, uh, but he was like, "Look, like we we know what these shows are, and like we've seen Seinfeld before. We know like it all ends up. You just do the same thing a million times over again, and like that's great. But uh, I I didn't think this show should have kept doing the same things a million times over again. Which extremely fair criticism. Yeah. So fair. I think that. I'm glad that, as you said, that Barry's wrapping it up. Uh, welcome to the Barry universe, Patrick Fischler. I'm always so glad to see that guy. His stuff with Cusino was the best. The laying, the leaving behind of the clues was so fucking funny. Uh, among the the hardest laughs I've had at that show. Do you do you drive a rocket ship? <laughs> made me laugh so hard. These episodes were great. Hank is so funny again. I'm happy with everything. Absolutely. And shout out Stephen Root, uh, a back-to-back -back Sunday night appearance from Stephen Root. Oh, he was yeah. in Succession and then in two episodes of Barry. So shout out to that guy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have an interview with Matt Mayer from Air, from the Dunkin' Donuts commercial with Ben Affleck, and a million other things. He's a great dude. It was a great discussion. Here is the interview. Joining us now, an extremely brunch-type guest from Air, uh, Matthew Mayer and Matthew, I want to start or Matt. We discussed before. You're a trailblazer. You go by Matt sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've we've already reviewed the movie, so anything that we say right now, anything we say about the movie isn't blowing smoke. It's already on record. And what we said about you in air was that you gave the closest thing to stealing the show in something involving viola davis because no one's really allowed to steal the show when viola davis is in something but you you came the closest anyone ever has congratulations thank you thank you thank you uh, uh it's a big consolation prize did did you feel doing that movie though i mean like a lot of people came you played peter moore the guy that designed the shoe and kind of the brains of the operation Every scene that you were in, I mean, every scene that everyone was in in that movie popped just because the, the acting was so strong. But yeah. did, did you feel as you were doing that movie, like, this is this is a pretty great role? Oh, for, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, it was a great. I mean, from the moment that I read the script, I was like, this is great. This is a score. I mean, I just thought it was really funny and really specific and, like, such a cool... You know, it was the first time I'd ever played a real person before, like somebody who existed previously, and he's, had, he's such a genius, and he's such an impact on culture, so I really felt like, this is, this is great. And But weirdly, once I got onto the set, um, it, it was just kind of a breeze, you know? I mean, I had all these, like, ideas, I, or, and some of them sort of sailed right into the movie. And some of them, almost immediately, Ben was like, oh, actually, you know what? Do this. Actually, this is what you should do. And 
and then we just shot it, and uh, and I pivoted immediately, and it was just sort of like the the vibe on the set was just so like friendly and collaborative, and people just like trading ideas and talking about what would work best, and kind of like problem solving the scene, and just like a really kind of egoless mellow way that like the sense of like oh my god this is like an amazing role uh an amazing person kind of just fell away and we were just sort of like working on these really fun well-written scenes what was the what was like the research process like going into that role being it being the first real person you've ever played and kind of are you a sneaker person like what was that research process like I'm not a sneaker person. My brother, Greg, is a sneaker person. He, like, collects Nike Air Jordan. So I, t- so I called him uh, and talked to him a little bit about it. And then, like, I read a book on Nike that talked about, like, the early days of Nike. And I watched a couple of documentaries where Peter Moore was, you know, featured and sort of talked about those times and that time. And, you know... I. Like, in some ways, I look like Peter Moore, and, but in a lot of ways, I don't. Uh, in a lot of ways, he's like, he's sort of just like a square kind of dad type who talks very directly. And um, I was like, oh, okay. We, and which weirdly, or I was like, huh, there are other people who look more like this guy that they could get. Um, but that kind of freed me up. It was like, clearly, they want, and once we got there, once I got there, this was clear, like, it, it's based on a true story and these are real people, but also Ben wanted to, Ben and Matt wanted to create, like, a new movie, like a fictional thing. And so he didn't want us, like, so tied to, like, how the characters looked or behaved, you know. It wasn't like a biopic in that in that way. He wanted, he wanted to, a fresh idea and sort of make them characters in a movie. So, you know. Affleck, uh, I mean, you, you will definitely get into your relationship with Affleck, uh, but you guys have just worked together a million times, and uh, he's directed you before. Was yes. there? It was weird. Like I'd never seen a sports dramedy directed by Ben Affleck and starring Matt Damon, but still, somehow, it felt in a non like not to say that it was like typical or whatever. It still like kind of felt like home. <laughs> like it, like they did what you would expect them to do, even though it wasn't something that you'd seen before like is that kind of how it it felt yeah absolutely i mean that is i would say i mean i've known them both since i've known ben since i was little i mean our parents went to college together um and we we became friends in high school um around you know a little after the two of them became friends and like we were all just sort of a big group about like 10 of us and we would all just sort of run around. And some of us were was doing were doing theater in a, at a high school drama department, and some of us weren't. And we were just a very tight tight knit group. And um, and so when they became massively famous in the nineties, it was both like really strange, like a strange surreal experience. But I think like the key to their fame, um, and this was true during Goodwill Hunting. And it's true now is the exact thing that you're saying that like they are per- they have the ability to um, take their personalities and like the way they are as people and sort of expand them to include like a mass audience, you know. So like back in Goodwill Hunting, like it's a great movie and it's really well written and really well directed and all these things. But I think what also captured people is the sense of like, these two guys wrote it and they're friends. And I now I feel like I know them and watching them, everything I see doesn't like nothing I see in their performances contradicts this feeling of like comfort. I feel around them. And I think that carries over in this movie that like, there's just something about where you do feel like, you know, them when you watch them in movies and sometimes that can backfire. Sometimes they're like, people are like, fuck those guys. But uh, oftentimes when they are really put their heart into a movie, um, people are like, I love those guys. I went to high school with them. You know what I mean? Like, I've known yeah. them all my life, you know? And which makes it surreal for those of us who have known them all our lives. It's a little like, well, I, I actually have known them all my life. Yeah. <laughs> and so I have a slightly different view, but actually the view isn't that different because you love them and, and I love them too. 
you know. You're a Matt and Ben hipster. Yeah. Uh, I was into them before you guys were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm OG. I'm a Gen X, Matt and Ben. <laughs> it's the 80s, guys. Yeah. The 80s. They talked about on the Bill Simmons podcast how after like their like when they're getting their career started they they moved out to L.A. and they brought out all their friends and and they were all like living together. Were you part of that group that was uh, that was living with them in L.A.? I was wondering like, did you were you ever in that house <laughs> like floating I in, in and house. out? I was in that. I was big at the house. My uh, my response actually like in a weird way they have aside from Ben hiring me a lot once he became a director, they, they both had sort of an indirect impact on my career, which is that, like, I want, really wanted to be an actor. Um, but I was, like, as when I was growing up, I was like, they are actors. Because, mind you, they were famous doing shit, you know, famous in a small way when we were young. They were, like, child actors. And they were, like, the vision. That I was like, those guys are movie stars. And I'm not like that, you know what I mean? I'm nerdy, and I'm already losing my hair. I'm, like, 17 years old, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not that. And my feeling was, I visited them a ton in L.A., but I was like, I I was afraid that if I just went to L.A. and tried to do what they were doing, I would just never get out of their shadow. Uh, so I, for that reason and a few other reasons, moved to New York instead and decided to just do a lot of, like, crazy theater. Because I really enjoy doing plays, and I also had an instinct that, like, the theater world in New York, particularly, like, downtown, like, avant-garde theater, would be, would accept me as I am now with no credit. They would be, like, interested. And there was a way into the world of, like, acting there. And that, so that's what I did. I mean, it was, it's a slow road, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's a real donkey. It's like riding a donkey up a hill. It's like very slow, but that was sort of the path that um, I took. And then through doing New York theater, made my way into TV and movies. Through that. that must have set you up perfectly for uh, Marriage Story because that's like what you are in, in that. You're like the avant-garde actor guy. Yeah, I mean, Noah, no, Noah knows Noah's sister-in-law Annie Baker is a good friend of mine and um, a playwright who I I worked with on a on a play set in, in Worcester called The Flick. Mm. And that is how uh, Noah Bombeck actually met me originally. So I think like he had Annie Baker. Even, I had worked with Noah before on a movie called While We're Young. Uh, but then yeah. he had Annie like... I want to set this movie. I want to give Adam Driver a theater company uh, because if I make him a filmmaker, I mean, I don't know what he said, but uh, clearly it's some, you know, he was trying to make him different from him. And so he made him a theater company and he was like, well, all right, let's get Matt and Wally Sean and the theater people we know and anyone else you can think of. So you've done, you you've got like a pretty diversified portfolio in the sense that like you've done TV, you've done theater, you've done movies, you've done commercials. What is your favorite and what's the most challenging? Uh well, I understand theater the most. Like I get theater. I've been doing it since I was young. Um and so I like I don't think I'm not somebody who feels like ah oh, theater is really real acting. Like I I sort of feel like it's all real acting, but I do say will say that I I I get it, like, in my body, you know what I mean? Like, when I'm on stage, I know how to, like, make it all work, uh, if I can. And film and TV, I'm just now, it feels like, really getting, having, like, a, getting a comfortable relationship with the camera and with how to, like, scale my performances and how to um, get a sense of, like, my own instincts in that kind of environment, if that makes sense. But what's my favorite? I mean, really, like, one thing, one great thing about doing movies and TV is that it's it's a lot of hanging around. And actually, like, the hanging around with, like, cool people that you're, like, working with, that's, like, for me, the whole, that's the juice, you know what I mean? That's the whole reason I'm in it. Like, I just like to hang out with, like, people that I admire who are doing, like, cool shit. And in film, it's like you just, hang out for 14 hours with like people that you're interested in sort of making something cool 
And that, to me, is more valuable than the thing itself, you know? Like, yeah. how you're actually living your life. And yeah, I feel, I feel like there's, like, a, a sports tie-in there with, like, you know, air. Like, people who play sports always talk about, like, the best part of being on a team is just, like, hanging out with the team aside from competing. There's, I, I always go back to that Boston College clip yeah. where they asked the guy what he's going to remember most from his four years at playing basketball for BC, and he just got real emotional, and his answer was uh, going out to eat, and that became like a <laughs> viral clip. And it's so funny, but it's, it's pretty related. You can understand that. Totally. I mean, that is it, you know, and I, I said this in some early interview, interview a few years ago, but like the whole reason I even became an actor is because at our drama department in high school that Matt and Ben were in, like, they were having cool parties. They were cool, you know, they were like, like good looking and cool and like interesting people and they went and had parties and they did these plays and I was like, I want in there, I want to hang out with those people. And that's it. And, like, that impulse is still, I see a play, a really interesting play, and I'm like, wow, that's so weird and fucked up and, wow, crazy. I really want to meet those people. I want to be in that play. And so I, you know, that's how I started. I'd be like, wow, that play was awesome. Do you want to put me in another play? You know, and <laughs> and that's how, that's how it all, like, started for me. And that's, like, the impulse, you know. Which is why it's like I've never been able to really do what Matt and Ben do, which is like write their own work, write my own work, uh, or direct. Because for me, it's like I see people doing great stuff, and I want to like be a part of it. If that makes so, sense. I want to watch a movie about like the rough and tumble Boston high school where the drama kids are like the cool kids and having the best parties and everybody wants to be in that. Cause I feel like the, the stereotype is that like drama kids are, are like goofy, nerdy and like the outcasts and like the jocks are the cool kids. So like, I want to watch the opposite of that, especially in Boston, which has a reputation of being like, I'm tough and I would say that masculine. every movie yeah. made like the last 10 years though, there's finally like maybe even an overcorrection where they're like, you know, the, the jocks kind of suck. And we're like, <laughs> we knew the jocks kind of sucked, but now they're like, you know what? Kids are cool. The nice ones. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it, it's definitely, there's definitely a moment for that. But, and the jocks, I mean, it was weird. It was egalitarian because the jocks were still cool at range. Um, and there was definitely a lot of nerds. I mean, I was a, fucking nerd in high school you know but there was uh but that's the thing it was it was it was a unique moment where the theater department offered a safe space for nerds and uh for like ugly nerds and good looking cool people to like get together and like share ideas you know cross cross, cross pollinate you know uh this uh, high school sounds like a utopia. It was not it, in my I, experience I, in high school. Yeah, it's definitely a yearly thing. Like some, this was like it was like this at my high school. My grade was okay, and at the end of senior year, we all generally liked each other and we all came together. But like the I, the year just below me, every motherfucker in that class was like best friends, did everything together. There was no, like, these people are cool, these people aren't cool. So maybe you just had a good year or something like that, but I, j just having lived, I gotta assume there's some messy shit going on at that high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where did you go to high school? I went to Belmont High. I went to Waltham High. Oh, Belmont Waltham High. We, we faced off against you guys at a drama festival every year. Uh, yeah, probably Bell smoked us. Right? Yeah, it sounds Bell like you have been Ben Affleck. I was a real competitor. I think we were all, we were always we had our eye on Belmont, on uh, Belmont and Arlington High. We're yeah, good. Interesting. We're always, always did good shit. At least in the eighties, you so, know, way before you guys were probably born. Before I even knew that you were a Cambridge guy, so I knew that you were in like the Affleck gang, but I didn't necessarily know how. And then. This is, it's so weird that we ended up getting connected these last few days, but because before I knew that you were even going to go on the podcast, I was kind of doing a deep dive and I was like, shit, you know what? A lot of the stuff that he was in with Affleck early was like Dogma and Jersey Girl. And I was like, maybe he's not in the Affleck gang and he and Affleck were just in the Kevin Smith gang. Uh, how did you all come together? I had, I answered an ad in Backstage Magazine um, in, like, 1996 to be in an independent movie called Vulgar. Um, 
uh, that was direct, that was produced by Kevin Smith and directed by one of Kevin Smith's friends, a guy named Brian Johnson. And me and Brian Halloran from Quirks and Ethan Supley, um, who's still still uh, uh, kicking around a lot, What's and that? we're all in it. And I sort of, back then, you know, I, I had a chip on my shoulder and I didn't tell Brian or Kevin that I knew Ben or how well I knew. Because Ben was, he had already gone chasing Amy. He was like super, he was like their main guy. But I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure that I got the part for myself, you know, and not because I knew Ben. But once they found out that I did know Ben, it was like, oh, great. Great, great, great. You know what I mean? Like, dun, dun, dun. You know what I mean? Like, no more auditioning. We're going to call you three days before we have to shoot and ask if you can just, like, come down and shoot Dogma or Jersey Girl, and that's just the way it's going to be, which was, you know, a good situation. I also want to talk about... Um, so you're, we do a thing called the Stuhlbarg Award, where, uh, because oh. one year... Oh, the vase that he just yes. made when we mentioned Stuhlbarg knew, warms I, my heart. I knew you were, like, one of us, even though, like, you, you're, you're just one of us. We love Stuhlbarg. We, 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 uh, we call ourselves Stoolies, which gets confusing online. Um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Say that on, on the internet. I mean... But uh, we do a thing called, every year, the Stuhlbarg Award, where... Someone who's in who's great in multiple things in one year because there was the year that Stuhlbarg was in Call Me by Your Name, uh, The Shape of Water, Shape of and Water. The Post. So we're so every year this past year it was uh, we gave it to Hong Chow because uh, she was great in The Whale mm. and uh, the menu and, and the, the, the menu. menu. Uh, but you're kind of Stuhlbarg awarding right now because uh, not only air but this Dunks commercial with Affleck, which I should note, shot on my street. That was like the one day I didn't go in there and uh, get everything. But there are I'm more wonder- there's one Dunks and Donuts on that street too. I don't know if uh, we shot in the one that you would necessarily go to. So I th- I think it was because after you guys left, there were like cop cars. Just like hanging out, just like hope no one wants to come do something to the <laughs> yeah, yeah, famously yeah. cops never go to Dunkin' Donuts otherwise. <laughs> yeah. You better fuck, fuck off. It uh, was crazy. It was just like closed. It was the first time I've seen a Dunks closed at like six PM or uh whatever. But uh, hour. I'm wondering, uh did Paul Giamatti mess up the recognizable actor not necessarily playing themselves in a commercial? Because Affleck is Affleck in that commercial, and when I saw it, I was like, "Oh hell yeah!" The, like the the whole gang's here, and yeah. uh, you, you're a guy at, at, at Dunks. So did Giamatti throw that off or what? When was Giamatti? So, yeah, he's in the Paul Verizon Giamatti commercials. In Verizon commercials with no, no disrespect to anybody else, but like uh, lesser known actors who play themselves, and then Paul Giamatti comes in as like the Easter Bunny or something. And I'm like, but that's Paul Giamatti. <laughs> yeah, they, they they like tell him to do the goofiest shit, and it's like, you know, that's Paul Giamatti, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's yeah. I I thought about that because uh, then I think pulled together the Duncan commercial. Uh, to two of them, he shot them both like at the same weekend, and I, then I got a call, and I think he was just like, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do uh, exactly, but maybe call Matt. Matt. Just get, if Max is around, just have him come. And I think, I think the time, I imagine since it came out the same week of air, that maybe there was some, you know, time ah, trying to he's work. He's always but, thinking ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I think he's, I think he's improvising, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, a question that, that we've always had about Ben Affleck that you could probably answer. Uh, doesn't that guy rock? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he rocks. He rocks. So yeah. <laughs> Good question. These are the hard hitting. Wow, I'm glad I prepped for this interview because these yeah. are hard hitting. Uh... We really, we yeah, we really like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we really like that guy. Uh, You're coming how, hard. How is how has like the air experience been? Just with it out and everybody. I mean, it's. I I was not surprised by its very high score on Rotten Tomatoes because Rotten Tomatoes, uh, as you probably know, is just did you like it or not? And I would be yeah. very very surprised if anybody went to that movie and was like bad time. I don't like that movie. 
I don't like it. No, I, I, that didn't surprise me. I, you know, what, what's weird is I, I, again, since it sort of fell out of the sky, you know, like, um, like there are other jobs that I'm like, you know, I'm on, I, I was actually like, I'm on this show, Our Flag Means Death, which is on HBO. And when I got the call for Air, which wasn't called Air back then, it was called like the Air Jordan, untitled Air Jordan movie. I was like waiting to get a call to find out if we were going to get a second season of Our Flag Means Death. Like, and so when I got the call, I was like, hello, you know, very anxious about it. And then my manager, who's also Michael Schulberg's manager. Oh, oh wow. Guy, Love that. A little, little, FYI, little connection. Uh, was like, uh, we got a call from like, Amazon and they're offering you this movie. So it just like fell out of the sky. And like three weeks later I was on set. And uh so I guess I just feel like I thought I had no expectations. It was just like fun. Three weeks later I was on set with Matt and Ben doing this great character. You know, and then I just like went home. So it wasn't like part of my like fantasy like, oh God, I really hope air is a hit. I got a lot of I got uh, eggs in that basket. So it sort of, everybody being really excited about it, and especially in this really like warm way. Like people are excited about it, and like people just sort of love it in this like nice, non judgmental way. And people are really, and it sort of revived, reminded me like of uh, how the affection I have for Ben and Mac, which, uh, you know, it's always there, but I'm like, yeah, those guys are great. And like, everybody's talking about it. So it just feels like this nice, warm surprise. You know, I wasn't expecting it. And now, and who knows what will come of it. Well, the, the movie's awesome. We both loved it. And we're, we're super glad that you came on with us because like I said, off the top, like you're just our, our kind of guy and, uh, you're you're super cool, so we're glad you did. And this. I'm so glad. I love your guys' podcast, and just mean for this particular movie to be able to talk to you know some Boston people about it. It's exactly exactly what I wanted to do. 